Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Awareness Explorers. This one's going to be a little bit unique. We are doing question and answers with a bunch of people that you we can see on screen and we're excited. And not just question and answer, but also mutual exploration, because I think as we explore topics, we all learn from each other. And I'm Jonathan Robinson. I'm with my trusty co-host, Brian Tom O'Connor, and with about 20 other people uh, here to explore really the basic topic is what helps you, what hinders you on the path of awakening and awareness. And, you know, sometimes somebody will say something, which I go, yeah, that would really help. Or they'll mention an idea and my head just kind of, you know, explodes. And I think I got to use that. And hopefully that will happen today as we explore together what helps us, what hinders us on the path of awakening. And we're going to have people uh, share their experience, ask us, Brian and me, questions, and we'll see where it goes. Um, life is best as an exploration that's not too well rehearsed, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, any thoughts before we begin, Brian? Oh, I thought that was a great introduction, just perfect. And and everybody, feel free to ask questions or comments or tell us your concerns or experiences that you've had. And and uh, But the only thing I want to add is just to thank you all for for joining us. This should be fun. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, I like to start off with asking you the question, Brian. Um, we've talked a lot about what helps us and hinders us on the path of awakening. But as I mentioned that topic, what's the first thing that shows up for you? Well, we were chatting earlier with some people who got on the call earlier. And, and because I think pure awareness, the background of all experience, it has no qualities of its own. It's not really a thing. So I, my favorite expression is, you can't see it, you can only be it. Uh -huh. You can drop back and ask, what is knowing my experience? What is, exp what is all experience appearing in? And you're going to keep going back and back and back because anytime you come up with a word or a concept or a name, that's known by something. What's that known by? And then when you just finally drop all that and you just be it, I think you're there. And I think the more often you do it, even little moments many times a day, the quicker you can just drop into it. Well, I think you said something key that traditionally we thought that, you know, you should meditate and then go about your life. And um, I think that that used to work. Uh, when we had a lot of time, but actually I think now, and there've been some studies, I was listening to a book called uh, How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain. And they were saying that most of the people who actually got to higher states of consciousness and stayed there, did it by, instead of like meditating for an hour, what they did was they meditated for one minute per hour. And they found that to be much more effective in actually changing the neural circuits in the brain. And I'm, I'm toying with that idea because I've, I've done the other for 30 years and it got me to where I am. But, uh, you know, to literally ring a bell once an hour, you have an app that does that and then do whatever you do to enter into a peaceful, aware, awakened place. And of course, on this podcast, we share lots of methods, but that's a, a really interesting idea and a whole paradigm shift as to how to go about awakening. And uh, I'm wondering if anybody has any comments or experience with that, um, because it's really a, a new approach to thinking about how to, quote, be spiritual. One of the things I like about it is that it helps to integrate these higher states of consciousness into life. I used to meditate and, you know, I'd be really awake and then uh, some, some crap would hit the fan and it would all go... <laughs> go down pretty quickly. But if you're doing this once an hour for a minute, uh, hopefully a thread is maintained. And the other thing I found is that a momentum happens. Like if I do a tool once an hour, there by the end of the day, I am noticeably in a different state of consciousness than if I say meditate in the morning and then don't do hardly anything uh, for the rest of the day. 
Does anybody have any comments or experience with that? Yeah, it looks like uh, Tatini. Yes. Tatini. Uh -huh. Yeah, if I ramble too much, please lift your hand. Um, I want to lay out this whole thing that hinders me, but it's in the context of what you just said, Jonathan. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, I also did since 30 years. I'm uh, For 15 years, I meditated. So 30 years on the journey, 15 years meditation and group self-discovery, exploration of my conditioning, wanting to let it go. I was with Osho. And he incorporated both the meditation and the um, exploration of the self, the conditioned self and his teachings. Then I got into waking down in mutuality, into embodiment, and had a, what the Jeffrey Martin people call fundamental awakening, well-being awakening. And mm -hmm. since then, it's been, you know, the, the experience is what I'm after, the tantric experience of, of losing the doer and just become whatever you're doing, the kind of the total let go and trusting in that, I find divinity. And I do that. It's my experience. I flow in life. Like in Ted's um, singing, I conscious, Jonathan and I did that together. Mm -hmm. I feel like I am in stage 14. Now, most of my day and I'm just flowing with what is and I don't resist when it's good and stuff comes up and it's not good and I then I feel like zooming out like that's again Jeffrey Martin's world zooming in and zooming out when I zoom out then I can get in touch with this meditative self that I know my aware self that's vast and doesn't have any problems with anything but I only want to do that when I'm feeling stress or anger or sadness mm -hmm. You know, so, um, um, so what hinders me is a little bit the back and forth. You know, I'm the witness and then I'm the diver. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a stress sometimes. Yeah, it's kind of like a muscle, the zoom in muscle and the zoom out mm -hmm. muscle and trying to get it smooth. You know, yeah. the zoom in muscle really is what we talked about in our last episode, the pure conscious experience where you are so involved in something that you lose yourself. Right. And and having a common vocabulary where we can talk about this is really helpful because as I realized there is like the zooming in approach to awakening and the zooming out approach to awakening, it helped clarify what I'm trying to do. But Brian, you, you were going to say something. I was. Yeah, uh, I'm, I will. I'm telling you, you were going to say something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I will add to that is one thing that, um, that, that I think helped me was that when I stopped worrying about whether I'm in it or out of it, or whether I'm feeling good or feeling bad, because even when my mind is busy, awareness is there. Even when my neurotic reactions show up, there goes Brian again, having a, neuro a neurotic reaction, but awareness is there and is totally okay with it. So the less I was worried about what state I was in at the moment, I found that helpful. Yeah, I, I love the recognition piece, you know, the moment something's going on and then the remembrance, the grace comes in and ah, I'm more than that. That's a great moment, recognition yoga. But then the tantra moment when I'm fully immersed and don't even try to recognize uh -huh. is another great moment. So it's kind yeah. of the witnessing tradition and then the tantric tradition where you go fully in. And that's when you go fully in, there is a moment of where you're not aware of being your conscious self that holds everything. So that moment when it's really hard stuff. Yeah, yeah then you're just being. That's, let's go. Then, oh, I want to recognize now. <laughs> I'm going to go back and witness. <laughs> <laughs> and then a minute of zooming out totally helps. Now I don't need another yeah, hour anymore yeah, of sitting. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Donna, you had your hand up. Uh, what, what would you like to add? Well, I didn't want to get up today. I'm fed up with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, did some meditation, you know, before you get up and everything. And then um, I'm looking around with all the tasks that I have to do, okay? And I thought at my age I could just sit and, you know, everything would be done for me. And uh, so I was doing my task, you know, heavy, heavy work, physical and, um, and then the thought came to me, are you uh, enjoying what you're doing? Are you in ease and light? And I thought, no, I certainly am not. And you know what? 
it's my mind telling me a bunch of garbage. And second thing that I wasn't doing, I wasn't with the mind gone, right? But just not, um, you know, in the silence while I'm doing things and just making an appointment that I have to do. And you know what? I started to feel better. Yeah. I really did. The burden that I was carrying around with me, like a, <clears throat> a carried uh, back, went away. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is what I have to do. Okay, be aware of what I'm doing with my mind, how I feel about what I'm, I'm doing, and am I in am I comfort in what I'm doing? Am I, am I in ease? Do I feel light? And do I, you know, enjoy it? Now, that's a big job for me to do, but it certainly makes my word, my uh, life easier. It really does. It, it really helps me. And I thought I would just share, share that with you guys. That's <laughs> great to hear. Yeah, that's great. You know, asking questions like that, am I at ease? Am I uptight anywhere? Am I... Uh, enjoying this is really the start to turning back to awareness or, or moving in the right direction. And uh, I love asking questions like that of myself or other people. Mm -hmm. am, mm -hmm. am I, am I, is there some place that I'm clutching against what's happening against what is, is there some resistance? Is there some tension? Is there to just look inside and noticing that and then notice mm -hmm. what's noticing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember being on Adyashanti retreat and he said, at any moment, if you look for it, you're either experiencing pure experience, which is great, or pure witnessing, which is great, or resisting something. So all you have to ask is, what am I resisting? Can I let go of the resistance? And you'll end up in, you know, either pure experience or pure witness. And I've looked at that, that that's actually happening on very subtle levels. So that can be a really useful question for people. Yeah, acceptance, to, you know, is the other one too, isn't it? Am I accepting what is happening in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Are we accepting it? That's a yep. big one. Right. <laughs> uh, and the, the, trick, the trick to that is when when you don't when you aren't accepting the little me sometimes doesn't has a hard time accepting and i i think it's possible you know i make a distinction between the little me and the big i little oh, me body mind personality ego big i vast clear open awareness sometimes mm -hmm. the little me can't stop can't be okay but there's something that's already Mm -hmm. allowing there's something that's already okay with everything and it's just shifting attention to that yeah you know it's something i've done um i used to be into self-criticism a lot and what i started to do which changed that was to say to appreciate how well i was able to do self-criticism and the same thing with when you are not accepting something can you accept the fact that you're not accepting something? And always taking that step back changes the energy from resistance to allowing. Yeah, I love how well I can't accept this. <laughs> I'm really good at not accepting this. Matter of fact, I'm incredible. Like I might be, <laughs> I might be the best at not accepting this. All right. And, All right. and that really just kind of takes that energy of resistance and unsticks it. And the same thing with, you know, think putting a self-criticism on you i shouldn't be that way well i'm really good at that shooting on myself you know and and that does unstick the the sense of stuckness that we get in when we resist ourselves or something in the world any other questions comments remarks yeah eliza uh, I would add the spin to um, where this has gone with acceptance that um, there's good information available in whatever the discomfort is that that's coming up. And even the resistance, there's some 
interesting thought or story that some part of me is attached to that's causing whatever it is the discomfort is. So it, it rather than trying to, um, you know, contend with that, even in the, the kind of spiritual way of trying to turn it into peace, I, I prefer to go through it <laughs> and um, really kind of take in whatever it is that's, that's there for me. So in that self-criticism, well, you know, what is that covering up? Um, so a lot of times it's some bit of vulnerability or pain that I don't want to deal with, for instance. Um, but I want, I raise my hand because the minute and hour thing, um, reminded me of the Course in Miracles workbook, which I have found um, helpful. Uh, I've done it uh, several times. I'm not really focused from within A Course in Miracles these days, but that aspect of that practice, um, I found very, very helpful. And I guess the objective with that, uh, they it's often five minutes an hour that they suggest. And, you know, it can be tricky to um, weave in five minutes. Um, and sometimes you can't, you just have to do it when you can, or you do it the next hour or whatever. But the more um, I have adopted that practice, which I'm making a mental note, I want to come back to, um, the the more it, it begins to shift to a kind of uh, state of constant, um, you know, what of Course in Miracles might refer to as prayer, but, you know, awareness, that, that state of allowing, um, it really does uh, help to, to keep that kind of constant state going throughout the day. And I recommend it. And I have an app that happens to be a, a Course in Miracles reminder app, but it has a really great feature of um, the hourly reminder you were talking about. So I get this pleasant little ding at the top of every hour when I, when I remember to set this and I can choose a workbook idea or I can choose to just make it, you know, a minute of, tuning in um but it's helpful so that's my share. yeah Thank i love you, the Liza. idea i love the idea of reminders i think that's great and there's a lot of ways to do it you can have an app that dings every few minutes or you can say whenever i'm doing something like i used to always whenever i was walking down a long hallway i would use that as a reminder to notice what the hallway is appearing in, because I live in the city and I worked in an office building and I live in an apartment building. But also the, uh, the best reminder is whenever you have any sense that something you don't like is happening, within or without, and you start to get sensitive to that, it means you're resisting. So anytime, oh, I'm, I'm feeling anxious or, or I'm angry or I'm sad or I'm, I'm just, you know, I have a pain in my foot, whatever. That's just simply a reminder to, to do that little half step back from what's in the foreground of experience to the background that it's all experiencing, all experienced in. Now, if you use your negative emotions as alarm clocks to wake up, uh, you'll be enlightened probably within about a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, Tatina. But, uh, yeah, I Eliza. wanted to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Along the lines of what Eliza, Eliza said, mm -hmm. um, where the resistances are is to me, I love human design. I love maps. I love the Enneagram. I love looking at conditioning. So resistance is where we, we come upon patterns that are dysfunctional, which are conditioned. So I love diving into that. Um, it has brought me to my gift that I have to give my individuality. So it's very important. And sometimes I get the, uh, the feeling that um, all this is that I'm meant to do is, you know, just zoom out when I feel resistance. No, I want to dive in here. This is where the juicy place is. This is where I want to grow. This is where I find myself. This is, you know, where the shadow frequency of consciousness turns can turn into a very high frequency of goodness and love that's shared to us individually. So I want to make a plug for let's celebrate resistance and non-acceptance. And it's all patterns we want to see. And we want to see is this childhood wounding, is this spiritual conditioning of 30 years of this is the way I have to be now. You know, there is so much going on in, in a psyche and the manifest does express through us really beautifully. 
and there is a sense of realness and this is who I am and this is what I'm meant to live when it's unconditioned and it's beautiful. So that's a long process, but it's worth it. Thank you. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's a sense of that some people when they get uh, good at zooming out or being in awareness, they can use that as a spiritual bypass for yeah, uh, avoiding their stuff. And it's a really interesting dance to to have the ability to kind of go into uh, impartial awareness and not use that as a defense from life, but to use to to use that as a way to better see your stuff and to sometimes go into it and and see what's going on. You know, I uh, taught a class called "How to See Your Blind Spots," and anytime you have a negative emotion. There's something going on there. And one of the questions I ask myself when that happens is what shortcoming in me might be contributing to this experience? Or, or what, what in me might be contributing to this experience? And that way I'm not avoiding looking at my stuff. And as you look at your stuff, hopefully over time, there's less stuff. You know, you start off with a big backpack of rocks carrying around, but, you know, eventually you decondition that and you become lighter until the point there where you're not triggered so much by stuff in life. And I think once a person experiences a little bit of peace, their main job is to kind of decondition and look at that stuff so it, it gets smaller and eventually shrinks. And uh, something... Uh, Ramdas once said to me was that every neurosis he ever had is still with him. It's just uh, much less bothersome and uh, is now like a pet rather than a big monster he's carrying around. <laughs> I yeah, like beautiful. that. Yeah, I would also add there's a comment um, in the chat that the idea that there's information in the resistance is like framing this practice like psychoanalysis. And the only thing I would say say to that is that the idea, my idea that I was sharing about the information and the resistance isn't about making more stories. It's just uncovering all the stories that might be there so that I can disengage them because the resistance is coming up around stuff that I haven't really seen yet. Mm -hmm. I haven't really looked at it yet if I'm still triggered. And when I look and then I can welcome it and welcome whatever it is it's trying to protect or whatever, then I can, you know, move through that in that same kind of disengaging way. So I, my objective is certainly not to just end up with, you know, better new stories. <laughs> right. I, I agree. And and I think that Robert's comment uh, uh, is, is, uh, very good because my take on it is that um, yes, you 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 should not avoid your emotions. You need to have your emotions. You need to allow your emotions. But the idea that there's something about you that needs to be fixed. When I let go of that, when I stopped trying to fix myself. When I stopped trying to change my neuroses, when I just totally said, this is what's happening now in all its, its good points and bad points in all my strengths, all my weaknesses, all, all, all is allowed and included and awareness is totally okay, even with my bad points. Then some mysterious alchemy happened and, you know, like, I used to be pretty hostile and mean and I got sort of happier and kinder because I stopped, but not because I fixed being hostile, because I totally saw that there was something that was totally okay with whatever and mm -hmm. started to identify with it. Yeah, Glynis. Yes, and, and it also is enormously helpful for me in terms of living with people and uh, uh, what happens is, is using that technique, precisely what you were talking about, um, I don't need for people around me to be a certain way. I don't need for my loved ones to be a certain way. They can just be who they are because it removes my reactivity of needing it to be. It is, and I'm kind of okay with that. Yeah, that's beautiful. 
That can save you a lot of grief. (laughs) And Jonathan, (laughs) what you were saying earlier about um, every hour, you know, we were talking about the, it's kind of akin to uh, back pain (laughs) because whenever I'm in an elevator, I correct my posture. And whenever I'm in a certain elements and it and and what happens is your posture shifts and your back pain just decreases. And so it's sort of kind of the same idea. <laughs> yeah, an, another kind of reminder. I like what you said about allowing people to be as they are. In fact, I've used that as a phrase. Um, you know, I'm allowing this person to be as they are just for now. And there's an incredible freedom in that. You know, think of your friends, your mate, your family, how much energy we put into basically insisting that they be different than they are, which of course doesn't help the situation whatsoever. You know, no one's ever, oh, now that you're, uh, now that you're disapproving of me, I will change. That doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so I, I like phrases that help remind me to wake up in, in different ways ways or in different parts of life. And one of them has been, I am allowing this person to be exactly as they are. And there's a feeling of, oh, I can relax with that because they consistently are as they are. (laughs) That is what they do. They do it really well. Even if it's to annoy me, they do it really well. And um, I can count on it. And as I just accept that, it opens up the energy and somehow they end up acting more agreeably. Yes. And I love the idea of saying just for now, because it removes the onus and the need for it to be permanent. Mm -hmm. And it can be many, many just for now. It's every now, everything can be just for now because it essentially is. Absolutely. Um, uh, Jay put a comment in, 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 the, in the chat. Uh, it says, what do you guys think about desires? Some traditions say desires are the cause of unhappiness, so we should resist desires. I think half of it's true that desires can be the cause of unhappiness, but is resisting a desire another desire? Is the desire not to have desires another desire? <laughs> or does the does the organism of the body naturally have desires and is it noticing what within us doesn't have desires noticing what within us is okay with everything and therefore doesn't need to change anything even while but i'd be curious to see uh, what uh, anyone else thought about that I think it's a great question, and and so many things on the path I see uh, that you can't make a rule out of it because what applies on one part of the path totally does not apply on another part of the path. So you know, a person might, as they're beginning their spiritual path, uh, do one thing, and ten years later, the exact opposite applies. So. Um, for me, I found that pursuing desires was really important when I was younger and going for it fully. And then there comes a point where, you know, I've done that enough and now it's just an indulgence and it's an indulgence that doesn't do anything for me. Uh, So I think you have to be honest with yourself, maybe whether you're on the uh, what could be called going out part where you're really pursuing your desires and seeing what's there for you. And when you're, you've kind of gotten bored with it and it's no longer, it's just a habit and it might be good to just kind of let go of some desires. Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. But of of course, everybody has to answer that question for themselves. Uh, I know Brent, you had your hand up. What, what do you, would you like to add? Yeah, as far as desire goes, I I think we need to look at this, like, honestly, I mean, I'm full of desires all the time. And I have to admit that without them, I probably would sit in the corner and and do nothing. I mean, desire is what motivates me, it motivates me to get my act together to to become as enlightened as I possibly can. I think it's a very good thing. And I and I do agree that 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 the desire uh, to get rid of desires itself is a, a desire also. 
So I think we got to be really careful, uh, like you were saying, Jonathan, about how we we look at this stuff. And um, uh, and I also want to just add that um, uh, I want to ask everybody here: is it, is there anybody here that talks out loud to themselves as a spiritual practice? <laughs> I don't yeah, know a bunch of yeses. Practice. I sure do talk out loud to myself. <laughs> well, I uh, I woke up in the middle of a process I was doing about six years ago, and I discovered that the deepening that was happening within me was due to the fact that I was talking out loud to myself about what I was feeling and about what was coming up in the present moment. And my consciousness was sort of um, backing up into its own nature and it was discovering that this character Brent, this egoic uh, set of identities uh, that I had my identity on, uh, was really the illusion. And um, it was a it was an amazing thing because uh, the words were coming out of my mouth and they were going back around and coming in my ear. And then I was making comments on what I just said. And then I was making comments on the comments and this feedback loop started up because it's the subconscious brain that actually makes the words come out. Like you can't pick and choose your words quickly enough consciously to talk. So that's the subconscious mind. And then consciousness is in the back listening to this. And so there was consciousness listening and commenting on what was happening. And this began a process that actually turned my attention towards things like consciousness, awareness, um, the present moment, uh, perception and the ego, which, which I've discovered I call the big four, consciousness being the place where everything shows up, uh, perception being how it shows up, the present moment being when it shows up, and the ego is the stuff in the middle that keeps us from the oneness that's underneath the ego that, that we're all coming from, that space of oneness that we want to be in all the time. So this process of talking out loud works extremely well. You can just start talking about anything and one thing leads to another. And if you do a Google search on this, because if you think it's a, a crazy idea, do a Google search, an advanced Google search and put talking out loud in the exact phrase field and then in the any word field, put benefits. And you'll get anywhere between 50,000 and about 2 million hits on that, depending on, on what time of the day you do it. So there's a whole field opening up with people talking out loud to themselves. Athletes do it. It helps the focus of concentration. Um, and it allows uh, the truth of, of what we're really searching for to come to the fore. So I would highly recommend that you look into that if you're not already doing it. It's, it's completely changed my mind, my life, and it's the best thing that I've ever, ever done. Well, what a great recommendation. I, I love hearing new methods like that. Thank you so much. It also reminds me of the, the famous poet Alfred Tennyson had a practice where he would say his name to himself over and over and over and over again. And he got into what can only be, I mean, he didn't have these words for it, but when you read his description, it's a non-dual state. It's a state where he stopped identifying with that individual name and and the other related thing is is when something is happening to me i sometimes like let's say i'm really all of a sudden get drawn into some pattern or emotion or or triggering or something i said there goes brian being anxious again and i might even say that out loud so it's not as it's developed a technique as what you described but it's, i think it's the start of it I use a technique called subtle noting. Uh, there's Buddhist noting where you kind of just note uh, with one or two words like, you know, thinking, feeling, hearing, uh, seeing, that type of stuff. Or it might be labeling your emotions like anxious, embarrassed. And then noting when, when you notice awareness, you know, might be peacefulness or stillness. And that's a, a kind of a, a takeoff on that method, Brent. And that's that's really helped me a lot. Uh, but um, I don't know if you know who Doffrey John is, a famous spiritual leader that died a bunch of years ago. Uh, that's the method that he used uh, mm -hmm. to awaken originally. And uh, he wrote down, he actually wrote down everything he was thinking and then realized, wow, this mind is crazy. And he started to identify less with the mind and more with uh, his beingness. And that was the start of his spiritual journey. 
uh, there's a book called the knee of awake and the knee of awakening or something like the knee of listening, maybe, um, in which he talks about that. And it was pretty interesting, but I might, I might take that on a little bit, just, you know, uh, it's a great way to get unstuck from all the stuckness our mind loops can get us into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Robert, I mean, it looked like you uh, go on, Brent. I, I, I mean, look at, look at what a therapist do. I mean, if you go see a therapist, really their function is one thing, and that's to keep you talking to yourself about what you're going through and keep your mind focused on that rather than drifting off. I mean, that's all they can really do for you. So you're actually talking to yourself about your own problems and you're feeling comfortable in the in the place you are. And so that leads to the way out of problems. And if you focus your attention inwardly, I find that a lot of these problems that we're trying to solve in ourselves, the parts that we want to change and everything, when your attention is on the search for truth, when your attention is in the present moment, those other things tend to sort of drift away. The, the reason they're they're in us and they're important to us is because our attention is on them. You can have your attention on, on anything that attracts you, but if it goes to what attracts you the most, then all this ego stuff has a tendency to just sort of like go away on its own and not every single thing needs needs to be looked at as some big issue that we need to overcome yeah good point good point robert were you raising your hand yeah um i was gonna say i uh study anything with the word wisdom and there's been a lot of academic studies uh in the last couple of years uh in that field there are probably 50 50 academics in there now and uh, they have some uh, interventions that uh, they try uh, in order to, you know, produce wisdom or, or what, you know. And um, there's a book called The Intelligence Trap that kind of summarizes uh, a lot of these studies. And one of the things they do is uh, one of, there's like three or four techniques that work so far that they've found and uh, which isn't that many, but it takes a while for them to do all the research and uh, something like personal distancing um, put where, and then there are a few different things you can do, like writing down yourself in the third person, writing your name, this, uh, and uh, there are some other techniques that you can research, but uh that's like one of the things they've found that definitely works is, is putting yourself in the third person. And then I also wanted to mention something about the back to the desire discussion. Um, I'm not a Buddhist expert, but or Buddhism expert, but uh, I know that one of the initial schools of Buddhism uh, was about the goal was purity and trying to get rid of desires. And um, a whole new school came uh, because they uh, disagreed with that and thought like we were saying, or several of you were saying, uh, it creates this infinite regress. And uh, tantric Buddhism is the answer to that idea of the goal of purity and no desire. And, and uh, tantric Buddhism is, is more embodied, I think, and, um, and doesn't say that desires are wrong. It's, it's less about purity and this idea that um, things are good and bad. You make some really good points there. Um, you know, I, and once again, I think at different parts of the path, what might be appropriate is different. So going fully into desires like tantric Buddhism or uh, letting go of desires could be another form of Buddhism. But I want to get back to what you said about the third person idea where you, you name yourself like Jonathan's thinking or Jonathan's worrying or whatever it is. I noticed that a lot of the most enlightened people I talked to did refer to themselves in the third person. They weren't necessarily using it as a technique, but 
that's just how they related to themselves. Like, you know, this crazy uncle that happens to live with me. Uh, and, <laughs> and I've used that as a technique and it is a really great technique um, to say, uh, now you have to be careful. You can't really use it in polite society when you're at McDonald's. You can't say Jonathan would like a Big Mac. You know, you have to say I. But uh, it it can be a fun game to play at a party with your spiritual friends. <laughs> and if you've ever done it, you set it up like, okay, let's all refer to ourselves as a third person. And then we did a Brian and I did a. a episode called Endarkenment, a couple episodes back, that you especially say your dark selves, your, your, you know, Jonathan's thinking uh, uh, your body looks really fantastic and would like to uh, lay down with your body, you know, or whatever it is. That he wasn't talking to me at the time. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't. You're right, right. But, you know, with a friend of mine or, or saying, uh, Jonathan, uh, thinks that your earrings are way too big. You know, just little things I wouldn't normally say. And it became really fun to have a party. We called it an endarkment party, and we did use a third person. And it just lets all this tightness that we normally have in us that doesn't come out. And it all just kind of makes it fun and light. And soon we were all as high as a kite just by doing little things like that. But so only do that with people you really know, love, and trust, and, and you know, and stuff like that. But Jonathan, I love the crazy uncle that lives with me. I hadn't heard that expression. That's so great. I think that's great. So Boris put this in the chat. In my experience, the cause of suffering is making a problem out of what's happening. If you make a problem out of desires slash aversions, I want this and I don't have it, or I want this and I shouldn't, then you suffer. I think that's very wise. Amen. Yeah. I want to say too that the state of desire or longing is one of my favorite sensations. That if I if I just go into that um, without thinking about anything needing to be different, like needing to actually have the thing that it is that I'm desiring and just enjoy the desire, it's fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yep. You know, I mean, that goes along the line of, of like, often in spirituality, I, I, I think that in especially non-dual spirituality, we have the idea that certain things aren't spiritual and certain things are. Certain, certain, and it's the paradox of non-duality that duality is actually part of it and that the individual and its desires and its personalities even though it's not what we truly are we can't like put that off in a corner and deny it it, it we have to include everything and the more we include and the more we see what in us already includes everything then i think the happier and more peaceful we can become mm -hmm. one of uh, my favorite meditations of of uh, Brian is called the include meditation where you start with whatever you're feeling. Maybe, you know, you're, you're not, you're feeling depressed or, or wanting something. And then you include your sensations and then you include your hearing and then you include awareness, you know, so you're including more and more, you're opening up the aperture because what happens, what causes most of our problems is that we get fixated yeah. on something and uh, we, we are, eliminating 99% of reality. And that usually causes some kind of problem. Any other questions, comments? Great discussion. Um, I would like to say I agree with, uh, about a year ago, I, I um, realized uh, that idea about inclusion. And I uh, started to try to include more and more. And um, I don't know of any specific technique, but that sounds like a really great one to, to try. And I'm, I've been trying it for like a year, but I don't have any techniques. Just I, I think of it as in, uh, inclusive. So a lot of people are talking about inclusive 
in the sense of race and and minorities and things like that, including people, uh, but also inclusive means ideas and um, and emotions and and things like that. So it's like including more and more seems to be an interesting way to develop. Yeah, yeah. George says it's like being a host hostess who welcomes, accepts everyone and everything. And, By the way, and oh, go ahead, Jonathan. I'm just uh, looking at everybody and, and if I feel warmly uh, that we can create these groups of people who explore together. And, and for those who aren't on this uh, Zoom call, you know, uh, exploring with friends and family, you know, bring up a topic, ask people what they think. Uh, you know, we get so much focus on, on the latest shooting or the latest bad news and being able to explore higher topics together. Um, you help to create a, a world that's around you that's very different and has a higher vibration. And I think it's an act of service. You know, sometimes even in the grocery store, I'll bring up a topic uh, with people and people almost always appreciate. I think we're all like secretly spiritual seekers or secretly wanting higher states, but we haven't culturally admitted it yet. Many years ago, I started asking people the question, have you ever experienced anything that you couldn't explain that kind of struck you as miraculous? And I was just playing with that question. And what ended up happening is that 90% of the people I asked this question to had had some kind of psychic experience or some kind of thing that they couldn't explain in their life. And they would rush to mention it and tell me their story. It was like, gee, I haven't felt safe to say this, but I want you to know, blah, blah, blah. And it was so much fun to hear these stories. And I had no idea that almost everybody had one of those stories. So I think almost everybody is seeking, you know, a greater love, peace and connection beyond our, our chattering mind. And when we allow these explorations and allow these questions and can listen to people that, that really good things happen, like on this call, but I'm talking too much. And anybody, anybody else want to say something? I, I would add that, um, uh, you want to, uh, I mean, I have a group of friends that I never talk about this kind of stuff with because they just simply aren't interested in. And, and it reminds me of one thing I learned early on. And although I totally, it's, and this is not an argument about what you said, I totally agree that sharing with people who are interested is just is wonderful, like we're doing now. But I remember a long time ago, I read something and said, not one other person needs to see for you to see. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I realized, yeah, I don't have to convince anybody of anything. I don't have to. In fact, I don't even have to change anything. And that's a big, <laughs> that's a big relief. And then some weird, strange reason things change. Mm -hmm. But not if you're trying to. <laughs> I don't know. It's a paradox. Yeah. Uh, Brent, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you said, Brian. But what happens to me is the more I get, the more oneness I get, the more truth I get, the more I just automatically want to share it. It's like I, it's like I, I can't not do that. So I think, yeah, I don't really, I, I don't have to do certain, certain things uh, for, you know, but, but boy, as soon as I get some truth, it's like, there's something in me that wants to share it because I really think underneath everything, we are all one, that there's this one thing that's awakening to its own existence. Like the, like the Aspen trees, you know, you go into an Aspen forest and you see all these stalks of these trees and you think, look at all these trees, but underneath the ground, they share the same root system. They're, they're, it's one organism that comes up off the ground and looks like many on a superficial level. I think that's us. I think down underneath is this thing 
that we experience with love when we when we meet each other and when we we connect at that level and that love is the revelation of this oneness conscious energy that we are to itself as this one thing because when you're when you're loving someone and got your arms around them you can't tell where you stop and they start and there's just this one thing there and i think that's what's emerging and will emerge once these egos recede that's beautiful and and yes the desire to share it is really there that's why jonathan and i have this podcast and that's why you're all here and 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 um and there's and there's joy in it and that's why it's so much fun to to do this with like-minded people mm -hmm. uh, tatini yeah yeah it's a wonderful lively conversation and um I want to be, I don't know if it's devil advocate or party pooper on this that will come out of my mouth now, but you know, at some point these conversations, because we're all so unique and some of us need to do zooming in more than zooming out and some of us want to share for others, it's good to hold back because it's more integrating. We are all so unique and we come from different places. This, these conversations sometimes can end up as, oh, this is my truth, and this is my truth, and this is right. It's kind, it is an argument. We are arguing with each other. This is what's true. No, this, but we don't say I'm arguing with you. We just say our opinion because we need validation too. I need validation for what I'm feeling my world is, and when I put it out, no. So and it's a bit know, of a frustration for me right now. You know, this, uh, what am I supposed to? I want to learn. I, that's why I'm here. I want to grow. But uh, no, Ooh. Mm. don't tell me how this is a pure ultimate truth. You see it in a particular way, Brian. You see it in a particular way, Jonas and Brian, too. You know, we all tend to become teachers for each other in some way down the line in these conversations. And I wonder if that has to be. It's a bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. Glynis, well, it can be frustrating. Oh. Oh. Did you want to respond? To sure. This? Oh, yeah. sorry. Very briefly, for, for regarding sharing. And uh, for me, what when I uh, often I will share, but I will share with the intention that I need them to receive it the way I want them to receive it, or I need them to understand it, or I need them to think the same thing. And I find that that's what I find with myself. And when I let go of that, the simple sharing, then I feel like sharing is is it's it's a, almost like a universal need because we're all we're all the aspen trees and we're all connected anyway. Um, but it's the releasing of the need for them to to receive it the way I want them to receive it, as opposed to simply sharing it and letting it land the way it's gonna land with them, kind of. Mm -hmm. That's the experience and what I would like to get to. Well said, Glennis. Yeah, and and that's I not may. an easy place, <laughs> let me just say, that's yeah. not an easy place to get to, uh, but it's what we can strive for, to, to share without them needing to get something and to listen to others without um with the desire to learn and that's where real connection happens and real learning happens the first time i was on uh the oprah show uh we were exploring questions together and and oprah was doing that with the audience and it ended up being uh oprah said the most out of control show she had ever done <laughs> security people had to be called in to actually uh, take gr uh, and grab people off the stage because people were screaming, the Christians were screaming at the Muslims, the Muslims were screaming at the Jews, the Jews were screaming at the at Oprah. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was just total chaos. And what I saw was that everybody wants to convert everybody else and not many people want to learn from other people and it's uh, it's a it's a difficult thing to let go of our attachment of wanting other people to get it and to receive from other people, and that's really a sign of spiritual growth when you can really listen and learn and not feel like you need to teach like I'm doing right now. 
<laughs> yeah, if I may, that requires, I, mean, I know my main focus is on, on connecting. I want to connect. I want to get who you are. It's like a moss to the flame. Tell me your world. I want to know what's true for you. I love the deepening in authentic, unwithheld communication. I'm exploring the, the circling stuff and the we wanting stuff. And that's beautiful when the transpersonal is there, the we field, but also the individuality can shine. Mm -hmm. So well, I want to nice connect, stuff. but how can I connect when everybody's on their own planet putting out their own thing? You know, that's, yeah. It's tricky. What, why are we talking? You know, learning, connecting. <laughs> yeah. Eliza writes in the chat, I just appreciate being able to share my own experience with anyone who can understand what the heck I'm talking about, no matter how their experience might compare. Like here, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> and, and you know, uh, Tatini, what you say is true. And, and even though we all have our techniques and we all are sharing what works for us, even that and even anything that Jonathan and I say are still words, are still concepts, and can't really fully describe real reality, truth, ultimate. Which is... Yes, totally. And it, it's so, so fine for me to be able to share this in this space, my defiant stance, kind of, because I haven't been able to do this a lot. And that's who I am. I'm always defying the rules and this and that. So it's just wonderful to speak it. And we had a conversation line before about just speaking stuff. I need to share and I need to speak. And yes, speaking stuff moves it when I'm Oh, somebody talked about a psychoanalysis and making stories. That was another one. Let's put that aside. When we speak it, it can move. That's my experience. And sharing is so important. And being gotten is wonderful. And also just listening is wonderful. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> well, we only have a little bit of time left. Um, does anybody have any questions that uh, you want to ask Brian or I? Are you doing this again? I was just thinking how much I enjoyed this. We should make this a regular uh, feature. We should, you know, because I love talking to you all. Uh, we should get together again and do it. I'm not sure how often, because we only publish every two weeks and every once in a while we have a guest on, but I like it. I'd be interested just in feedback of any uh, show topics that you would like us to cover um, or anything uh, that you were maybe really impacted by on one of the episodes you heard. Like, for example, when we did uh, when we interviewed Tammy Simon, I really liked what she said about business and spirituality, which you don't hear that much, you know, how she really uh, does karma yoga in serving her community. Uh, and that particularly impacted me. Brian and I are always uh, brainstorming topics and uh, we might as well brainstorm with you. So if there's any topic, either uh, put in the chat or, or tell us and we'll definitely consider it for future episodes. While you're thinking, I'll just read that George wrote, sharing can be done also with being, embodying our truth, not just talking. My life is my message. Uh. Yeah, just be, when you just, just be. And that's a form of sharing. It's beautiful. And that quote, my life is my message, is a quote from Gandhi, uh, which uh, has always touched me. Oh, thank you, George. And, and I like to share, when I heard the, in an audio, Ram Das saying that we don't have the moral right to tell someone else, tell someone else the truth. I mean, of course, everything is debatable, right? Uh, it made me think, or I mean, not think, but whatever, m me wanting to tell people and who wants to tell who, and with what expectation and with what moral right. And that changed many things for me. Mm. And it's, it's lovely to have this gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Well, thank you, and, and, and Jonathan and everyone. But I know Brian more. <laughs>
Uh, Robert writes, money is always a controversial topic in spirituality. That's true. We haven't really talked about that. That might be a very interesting Definitely. Uh, I, I wrote, topic. you know, I wrote a book uh, called Real Wealth, A Spiritual Approach to Money and Work. And of my 14 books, it did the poorest. <laughs> <laughs> but what was, what was interesting about it was that I got the most letters from that book. So people who liked it were like really impacted because it's almost like a taboo subject. Um and, and I think that would be a great topic to really explore. So thank you for that, Robert. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, Melanie. Um, right, yeah. And someone else that was I found interesting was Andrew Holchek, who did a lot of work on dream, um, dreaming and also bringing that, tapping into that um, in your daily life and, you know, working with seeing the world as more um, illusionary and, it, it was it was pretty fascinating his his book and his, he's done so much himself in in uh, in you know in Buddhist um, background <laughs> and then I also was so curious about you know Mukti who is Andi Shante's wife mm -hmm. That's another possibility I would love to, I think it'd be really interesting to hear her, the depth of her you know realization and yeah. and everything and I've I've so enjoyed um I I started listening in after I heard your Jeff Martin uh, podcast and then I went ahead and took the uh, his his forty five day class, course and Brian was the one before me so it was really cool to connect that way and and after um, that I went back to and started going through all your podcasts starting in in twenty eighteen and I'm up to about almost through twenty nineteen now and it's just been just a wonderful exploration and it was so um, coincided with the class I was taking because you did Richard Lang you interviewed Richard Lang right and we got to the headless way and then and it was it was just such a and then when you did, um, you know, the Netty, um, John Aston, and when you interviewed John Aston, I was just d done the Netty test on part of it. <laughs> and it was just a wonderful coincidence. And I, I think it's something I want to keep going almost every day to um, listen to one of your podcasts. They've been so relevatory and helpful. So thank you so much. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you. I love how they dovetail together. That's great to hear. And we do hope to have Andrew Holacek, uh, and I'm reading his book about uh, uh I forget what it's called, but yeah, um, dreams and illusion and the the, the teachings. Uh, so hopefully we will have him and Mukti. Uh, yeah, I've met Mukti. She has a wonderful energy, and of course, you know, we probably uh, we interviewed Ajashanti, and and hopefully we will get her on as well. Oh, great! That's a Thank great you. Idea. And Barbara says, I think Steve's quote from Ramana Maharshi, "Change no one," could be a good topic, which. Uh, um, Eliza seconds and uh, Cliff says potential show topic why are we still stuck in the concept of oneness why not connected autonomy hmm. uh, George says ethical investing is huge true yes how can we connect slash network with all the different spiritual groups might be a topic too Thank you. Those are all really very interesting and we're taking notes. Anything else before we uh, call it a show? <laughs> Ajay, oh, you, you're, you're just raising your thumb. I like that. <laughs> no, it's been really fun and, and, um, one thing I took from this is that, you know, we really all are explorers here and it feels good to be part of the same tribe, you know, listening, exploring, and, and it keeps going on and on. And it's been a great honor for me to uh, have a friend and buddy like Brian to explore with. And, uh, and hopefully it'll we'll keep going for a long time more. Thanks everybody for joining. What's a, what a delight to see you all. Yeah, thanks for opening this up. This has just been wonderful. Great, and I'm I'm always I'm always amazed at the collective wisdom out there and how many how how you all get it. Thank and, you. It was wonderful. And feel free to uh, correspond with Brian and I and ask questions or give show ideas and. Uh, 
tell people, support us on the Patreon page, blah, blah, blah. The same things I always say, but we really have enjoyed the emails that we get. And, and uh, I think both Brian and I kind of see it as like we're creating a community and family and your participation is, is really important to us. Yep. So welcome to the family. And you know what we say at the end? Keep exploring. Keep exploring. <laughs> No choice. <laughs> no, no choice. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. That should be our new, our new <laughs> slogan. No choice. <laughs> this is it. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Hey, take care. Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends, because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.